elements were discovered one at a time with no clear relationship among them. But elements of similar properties began being stacked upon one another, heavier ones at the bottom of the column and lighter ones at the top of the column. And so what was noticed as one moved from smaller atoms to larger atoms, properties changed. But every now and then, periodically, the properties would repeat themselves, and hence the name periodic chart. Russian scientist Dmitry Mendeleev, the same man who brought the metric system to Russia, is credited with observing this pattern. Others had to observe it, but Mendeleev was the first to publish, and hence he gets credit for it. Now, one of the magical things about the periodic chart is it now becomes predictive. If one looks down any column, all of the elements below that will share similar properties. In other words, if I know some of the properties of, say, fluorine, I can predict what some of the properties of bromine will be. Periodic charts come in a range of sizes and colors and different amounts of information, but they all share something in common. They all give a minimum of three pieces of information. The chemical symbol, the atomic number, and the atomic mass. For purposes of navigation and discussion, the periodic chart is arranged in periods and groups and blocks. Let's look at each of those. First, let's look at the key blocks or areas that make up the periodic chart. The first block is called the main group. That's these two groups that are on the hillside, and we'll consider this the valley. These two groups on the hillside together make up what is called the representative elements or the main group elements. Next comes the transition elements. That's these elements that are down in the valley, as it were. And finally, there's what's known as the inner transition. That's these that make up this little island at the bottom. Now, they may be represented as an island, but actually they should be sliced right inside the transition elements, hence the name inner transition. So if you notice, the numbering goes from 57 to 72. Where are the elements in between? That's the inner transition. And similarly, this second row is also an inner transition. So those are the three main blocks. Next, let's have a look at the periods and the groups. Periods. They're the horizontal rows that go across the periodic table from left to right. There are seven rows on the periodic chart. Remembering that this top row of the inner transition elements is spliced into period six. And the second row of inner transition is spliced into row seven. Groups are the vertical columns that make up the periodic chart, of which there are 18. A number of the groups are given special names, of which I only want you to remember four. The names for group 1, 2, 17, and 18. Group 1 is also known as the alkaline metals. Group 2 is also known as the alkaline earth metals. Group 17 makes up the group known as the halogens, and group 18, of which almost everyone is familiar, makes up the group of noble gases. 
There are also two named periods. The top row of our island, which comes right after lanthanum, where it's spliced in, that period is known as the lanthanides. And the second row of our island, of our inner transition, which splices in right after actinium, is known as the period of actinides. So the groups and periods we've named are alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, halogens, noble gases, lanthanides, and actinides. This simplified diagram shows those six names as well as the three main blocks. And finally, in our discussion of the periodic chart, are nonmetals and metals. Being able to differentiate between those two classes is very important because as compounds are named, they'll take one set of rules for naming them if they include metals, and it's an entirely different set of rules if the molecule is made from nonmetals. The stair step that's shown in the graph, everything to the right and hydrogen make up the group of nonmetals and everything to the left make up the group of metals. As you can see, there are many more metals than there are nonmetals. Now, perchance a periodic chart does not show the stair step, it's very easy to identify. You start at the very tip of boron and just work down in stair step fashion. Sometimes I'll draw a line beneath hydrogen or maybe all the way over just to make sure to remind myself that hydrogen is also in the group of nonmetals. Now there's a third class called metalloids. And these are some of these elements on the border of the stair step that usually they act like metals, but they might act like nonmetals. Or usually they act like nonmetals, but sometimes they'll act like metals. You do not need to memorize those for this class. We're going to be very clean with this and say something is either a metal or it's a nonmetal. So you don't have to memorize what the metalloids are. You just merely have to know what a metalloid is, something that shares properties of both metals and nonmetals, and know the fact that they exist. And with that, you should be able to navigate yourself around the periodic chart and be familiar with the terminology quite well.